uh, with the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center. Uh, and third, uh, part of the State Climate Office of Ohio. So we do have a climate office for those that may not be aware. Uh, we like to call ourselves SCU. Uh, it's easy and, and kind of uh, uh, easy and cheesy, but easy to remember. So uh, yeah, and the cover photo today is just, just a, a recent photogenic thunderstorm that, that developed to drop some small hail across western Ohio. A little bit of damage to crops, but nothing too hateful. But I think as we've turned the page now from spring into summer, it's just a nice picture to capture that. Hey, and Aaron, I'm sorry about that. That's I, I'm okay. sorry I dropped off. I have no idea why. Again, this is one of those uh, wonderful computer things. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say uh, thanks for doing this and take it away. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so some general information. Uh, obviously, this is a collaborative activity between a lot of centers, uh, NOAA, NCEI, and Doug, National Weather Service, NIDA, CPC, and others. Uh, the Climate Hubs, USDA Climate Hubs, American Association of State Climatologists, uh, the Regional Climate Centers, the Midwest and High Plains, and the National Drought Mitigation Center. Uh, obviously, uh, for those that have joined us in the past, this is a regular thing on the third Monday, or sorry, third Thursday of every month. Uh, the next one up is on the 20th of July. Uh, and it will be presented by Jeff Andreessen from uh, the Michigan State Climatologist. Uh, Doug would also like me to, to remind folks or let folks know that there will be a Northern Plains Drought Information Call next Wednesday, the 21st of June at 10 a.m. Um, really, this is to attract tribal, state, local government, as well as ranchers, uh, farmers, and other sectors to come to and, and talk about, the uh, obviously, the area being impacted across the Northern Plains with the drought conditions there. Uh, you can uh, access the future climate webinars and information with these links, and like Doug said, we'll have some question time at the end. Hey, uh, so, uh, Aaron, what I might do, what I might do is stick it in the chat of this conversation. Uh, how to uh, sign up for that? If I can figure out how to do that, otherwise, people can contact me if they want to uh, uh, get that information on how to get on that webinar. Thanks. Okay. Terrific. Yeah, so the agenda uh, today, we, we certainly have a full plate of things, and as usual, we do the uh, recap uh, this last month, uh, May 2017, as, long as, as well as the uh, March to May conditions. Uh, look at some more of the recent and current conditions um, and, and their impacts then in the ag sector uh, on snow and water and some other impacts. And then we'll end with the climate outlooks, both from the near-term uh, and long-term perspectives, as well as INSO uh, moving forward. All right, so to begin with the recap, um, uh, looking at the statewide average temperature ranks for May of 2017, I think it's, it's clear to see across much of the north central region, uh, mostly the white shading here in the map indicating near average temperatures uh, compared to the long term record here, so uh, near average conditions across much of the north central region. Uh, this is a little bit different than what we had experienced throughout the springtime with the very warm weather we had in April. Um, we do, did see above average conditions in Montana uh, and below average conditions there in Kansas, but in general, close to, to, close to the long-term uh, average here uh, in terms of, of ranking. Um, and, and this was very similar to the, to the contiguous U.S. kind of ranked near the middle of the 123-year period. Uh, looking at differences between uh, the temperature ranks with highs versus lows, so not a lot of change here. They're cooler than... Um, a little bit cooler in terms of temperature uh, daytime highs in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Colorado. Uh, above average across North Dakota and Montana and the rest of the, the central U.S. looking at near average conditions and then with, or sorry, near average ranks. And then if you look at the, the nighttime lows, the one that sticks out really is Ohio with above average. Uh, it was certainly a wet month here so that that uh, played into it, and then um, below average there in Kansas as well. So as far as the precipitation recap for the month of May, it's really above average across the eastern and southern stretches of this region. Uh, you can see many of the states uh, at least approaching top 10 or top 20 wettest um, for the statewide precipitation ranks for May 2017. Just the opposite of that across the northern plains there from Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, below average in terms of the state precipitation ranks across those states. Uh, this was the 25th wettest on record for the, for the U.S. Uh, tying 2009, and in general, most of the, the central and, and eastern part of the north central region uh, was above average. 
So now looking at the, the um, meteorological sp uh, spring here, the March to May ranks, uh, again, we've got the warm colors uh, for this period, so above average to much above average across the entire north central region. So states like Ohio and Indiana, much above, along with Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, the re rest of the states in our region, above average as well. And this was despite that, that sort of middle of the rank uh, month of May. So the, the really warm conditions in some of the states in March and obviously in April uh, really weighed heavily here. In terms of the precipitation, again, the very wet spring for many of us. Uh, from Kansas to Missouri, Illinois, up to Wisconsin and in the, in the Eastern Corn Belt in Michigan as well. So uh, these are close to or, or top 10 and even top five in some cases. So if you look at the, uh, the wet conditions here in, in uh, Kansas and Missouri, uh, these are very wet March to May ranks. Um, and again, just opposite of that, the very dry conditions that, that have crept up very rapidly across the Northern Plains with North Dakota seeing now uh, the ninth driest on record for this long-term uh, period. All right, so let's go ahead and move then to the more recent and current conditions. We'll start out with the last 30 days in the temperature ranks. Uh, the graph is showing the departure from normal temperature from mid-May to mid-June. Uh, there are some regions that we saw cooler than average uh, temperatures from parts of Colorado and southeast Wyoming uh, into northwest Nebraska, and also in the upper Midwest, say northern Mis uh, Minnesota, some parts of northern Wisconsin and northern Michigan. Uh, but overall, the, the, the plot's really showing a lot of warmer than average temperatures over the last 30 days from eastern Nebraska and Kansas, uh, eastward through Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and also Wisconsin and, and Michigan. Uh, some of the anomalies here are approaching three or four degrees Fahrenheit in some locales uh, from Ohio, Michigan. And then again, these very warm conditions also being experienced across eastern Montana or large portions of Montana northern stretches of Wyoming, uh, South Dakota here, and much of North Dakota as well. So we're going to see that that, you know, again, if you joined us last month, uh, where, where April temperatures were sort of being tempered, we've now switched to, to you know, very uh, warm conditions across the north central region. And ultimately, this is part of the role then that's impacting the moisture availability uh, for the north central region. Looking at the last 30 days of precipitation, I've, plot, uh, I've put two uh, graphs here from the High Plains Regional uh, Climate Center. So we're looking at raw precipitation in inches in the upper left for the 30 days, and then the percent of normal in the bottom right. So we do have this bullseye precipitation across northern uh, Wisconsin, where in excess of eight inches has fallen in the last 30 days. And there's some wetter, uh, you know, if you look at the bottom right uh, panel, you can see that's, you know, one and a half to maybe as much as three times uh, the, the normal amount of precipitation for that period. Uh, and there's some other uh, regional or sorry, local uh, wetter conditions as well. If you look at, say, across northern Colorado into northwest Nebraska, across northern Kansas, and then again, parts of Minnesota into the UP of Michigan. Critically dry conditions across Montana, we can see that in the amount of precipitation that's falling and more so in the percent of normal. So some of these percent of normals are dropping below 25 and even 5% in this region uh, from Montana, North Dakota, and into South Dakota. A lot of impacts that are occurring and ongoing up here. Uh, the other area that I really want to point out today is this area developing in northern Missouri, also into southern Iowa, and extending into parts of Illinois uh, and southern Indiana and perhaps even parts of Ohio. So this area is really drying out rapidly over the last uh, one to two weeks here. And we're going to see this theme repeated uh, throughout the uh, presentation today. So one of the, the, the charts, uh, the graphs that's used in, in the webinar here is looking at the total column soil moisture anomaly. This is a modeled product. Uh, and this is anomaly in millimeters. And it's um, so anywhere we see the blue shading, we can see the soil moisture is, is um, in surplus of average conditions here. So we can see uh, the, the soil moisture is, is, is quite moist across Kansas, parts of Colorado, the Intermountain West as well. Uh, the area here across northern Minnesota and the UP of Michigan is also showing the blue shading. So the soil moisture is, is adequate here. Uh, and again, we're, we're looking at soil moisture um, negative anomalies across South Dakota, uh, very much so across North Dakota and Northwest Minnesota. 
and this other area that's now developing across northern, Minnesota, uh, no northern Missouri, southern Iowa, and stretching into central parts of Illinois. So with, uh, with these dry conditions happening in a couple of locations, I, I, I decided to put a couple of plots just to deal with some of the stress that's happening. Uh, this is the evaporative stress index, just looking at comparison between evapotranspiration and the potential. Um, one of the good things about the ESI is it's really high resolution, so four kilometer resolution here, um, but it, it can be in, um, uh, contaminated a little bit by clouds. But anyway, I, I think it's clear the, the stress, the ESI, uh, very low across the Dakotas, uh, eastern Montana, parts of northwest Minnesota, as I've been repeating here. And then again, this, this other area that's developing in, in northern Missouri uh, across uh, Illinois and Iowa, and really it shows that these areas are anomalously high rates of water use across the land. So a lot of evaporative demand here uh, leading to the, these very low numbers in the evaporative stress. Another tool I decided to display this week is the quick dry. So this is a, a, a large-scale collaborative effort from researchers from the National Drought Mitigation Center and Nebraska-Lincoln, USDA, U, U, USGS, and others. Uh, really, the model, it, it, it is a model product to incorporate multiple remote sensing and climate-based inputs. Uh, but the good thing, uh, the thing that it, it really serves is kind of a drought alarm. So it's designed with the improved sensitivity to early stage uh, drought conditions. And so we can see this evolution from May 28th through June 11th on, on the panels here. Um, the dry conditions were already evident across the northern plains, northwest Minnesota here on the 28th intensified uh, here by June 4th, and really has remained close, close to that uh, in the more recent period up to June 11th. And I wanted to use it again to show uh, this, this area here in northern Missouri and Iowa um, where the, the conditions are rapidly, uh, the stress is rapidly increasing in this region, again, due to the high evaporative demand. And as Paganon and the state climatologist in Missouri points out, this is very, um, you know, a very rapidly responding area to these dry conditions because of the high clay soils here. And since there's been very strong evaporative demand in this region, um, the conditions are drying out quickly. So it really emphasizes both the areas of, of dryness that we're watching across the region. So to contrast that then, let's go ahead and look at the 24-day average stream flow. Uh, I'll start with where, where stream flows are still high. So we, we have some very high flows out here in western Wyoming, and I'm going to show you some great photos of that here in just a moment. We got high stream flows from northern Kansas into western Iowa and across southern Minnesota and northern Wisconsin, and some smaller areas here in southern Missouri, northeast uh, Indiana, across western Ohio. Um, again, note the, the, where the stream flows are, are quite low, so we're seeing that across the Dakotas and parts of eastern Montana that match up with the precipitation deficits and also the impacts that we're seeing. Uh, and that stretches also in the northwest Minnesota. And then this region here across northern Missouri, again, that's responding very quickly to the high evaporative demand, uh, those, those high clay soils, um, clay soil content there that, that's really dropping those stream flows quite, quite quickly. So it really matches up with the products showing the drought stress uh, on the previous slides. So all of this is to say uh, today we, we, uh, the new U.S. drought monitor was released, and uh, this map looks quite different than it, than it did a month ago. Um, and you're going to see that the changes were, were very rapid. So we, we, we can see la um, the current conditions in terms of no drought or no dryness have decreased from last week, and then we've seen a bump up in the D0 to D4 conditions as well as the D1 to D4 and D2 to D4. So we can see that conditions have deteriorated rapidly across central North Dakota and north central South Dakota, uh, much of those states in, in fact, uh, but we've got D2 severe drought conditions already on the U.S. monitor there, and also here in eastern uh, Montana, stretching up into uh, northwest Minnesota. We've also had this rapidly deteriorating region in, across northern Missouri, so we've got D1 moderate drought conditions now for several counties there in Missouri that line up with those very low stream flows, again, and some dryness that's extending from Iowa across northern Illinois into Michigan and across the central part of those states into southern Ohio as well. 
And I think it's really dramatic to look at the one-month change map uh, from the U.S. Drought Monitor release this morning, uh, showing some of these regions have, in just one month, we've seen a three-class degradation uh, in the drought conditions here across eastern Montana, parts of North Dakota, and much of the area in this region, a two-class uh, degradation in the U.S. Drought Monitor. And we're really going to, there's uh, numerous ag impacts from this as well. And also, again, this area down here where we've seen intensif uh, quickly intensifying drought conditions across northern Missouri. We did see some improvement across central Colorado and other parts of Colorado and a little bit here in Wyoming, so that is good news there. Uh, but we've got a lot more drought conditions overall across the north central region. All right, so let's move on to the impacts that we're feeling then from, from all of this that's happening. And I've um, had to really pick and choose which, which photos. There's a ton of photos coming out from the north central region on this. So this is um, really a, a dichotomous picture of uh, the dry conditions that are happening up in the, in the northern plains on the left. So these are winter wheat conditions, and this is courtesy of uh, Laura Edwards, the South Dakota State Climatologist. Uh, looking at those deteriorating uh, conditions for, for plants up there and grasses. Uh, on the right, it's really a picture of some sidewall compaction issues that we're seeing in, across the Corn Belt. Um, and there's multiple factors that go into that, not just the wet soils, but also uh, when and how um, corn and, and different plants were, were um, planted and, and the timing. So a, a lot of different impacts that are happening across the region. If we look at soil temperatures, Obviously, these have surged and, and are quite warm throughout the, the middle part of the country, extending up into Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio as well. We do have a, the area across northern Wisconsin where soils are very wet. We've had that precipitation bullseye in terms of in excess of eight inches there with still having cool soil uh, for the four-inch bear. The NAS topsoil moisture, again, this is a picture that's drastically changed from last month. Uh, so we were looking at a lot of single-digit percent short to very short topsoil moisture uh, during mid middle of May. Uh, now, just the changes um, from one week here, we're looking at you know 20 to 30 uh, percent changes across much of the region here, across the southern tier of the north central region, and even across the Dakotas and Montana, which were already showing short to very short uh, moisture. Have, those have increased as well. So we've got a, a, you know, a, a wide swath over cr much of the region with, with short to very short soil moisture. Just the opposite of that, the, the blue shadings here across the eastern Corn Belt we had last month with the percent surplus have disappeared, and a lot of the surplus are now in the single digits. Uh, again, big changes from the previous week. Getting into some of the, the progress of plants. so. Uh, as a percentage nationwide, we've passed that 95% threshold on June 4th, so I'm just showing the percent emerged. Again, across parts of the north central, we, we um, somewhat ahead of schedule here uh, across the Dakotas from the early, the early season um, conditions that were a little bit more favorable, obviously, uh, where it, it was extremely wet across Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, Wisconsin, and Michigan falling a little bit behind, uh, but not too much really, uh, maybe a little bit more here in Michigan in terms of the, the corn that, that has emerged. Uh, looking at soybeans, kind of a similar story. So most of the north central region, a little bit ahead of schedule compared to, to in terms of percent planted and also emerged. Uh, but if you're looking at those states that have been a little bit wetter, quite wet actually, uh, those are, you know, change from the five year is, is down a bit. So a lot, so we get reports out of southern Indiana that a lot of the farmers are either, you know, replanting twice uh, this season because of because of the wet conditions, and certainly a lot of times when they're planting corn, they wait until corn is planted to plant the soybeans, and that that has a ripple effect there. Uh, winter wheat. I just wanted to show this to, to show that the, the harvesting has begun here across uh, Illinois and, and Indi Indiana uh, for the winter wheat. Really, the ugliest slide that I have to present today is, is in this U.S. spring wheat conditions. And so I think uh, this is just you know, one of those large impacts from what's happening across the northern plains. In terms of the percent emerged, early season conditions allowed that to happen. However, if you look at the percent here in the upper right for good to excellent conditions, uh, compared to the change from last year, these are drastically lower, very, very much lower than last year. 
again, these slides are courtesy of, of Brad Riffey at the USDA Office of Chief Economist. And, and there's this slide uh, here on the upper left just showing how much uh, worse 2017 start of the spring wheat condition index is compared uh, to the recent year. So we're really, really bad start here in terms of the U.S. spring wheat conditions across the northern plains. And the same can be said for past years in oats, uh, where the conditions up here in the northern plains are, have really, are really depleted compared to last year. Uh, past year across much of this other region is, is, is faring a, a bit better, uh, along with the oats here in the southern sections of the growth zone. Um, as far as sorghum goes, South Dakota is showing this big change from last year again because of the conditions, but elsewhere across the central, uh, we're looking about where we should be. So we had a lot of, uh, uh, really I would say, uh, a plethora of, of impacts coming in uh, on the ag side of things. So I, what I've tried to do is, is break these down into a regional northern tier and a southern tier, and I would, I would call the northern tier this rapid drought development that we've seen. Um, and so kind of to distill the message down, what we're looking at, some of the, the bigger impacts here uh, coming out of this region, we're looking at cattle being sold uh, quite earnestly. And, and Laura Edwards has told us that, you know, it's both yearlings that would normally go to feed at this time, but also cow-calf pairs. Uh, so that indicates herd calling, uh, where there's just not enough feed there for, for, for the, the, the livestock. And so uh, that's, a, that's a big indicator of the impacts that are hitting very quickly there. Uh, winter weeks being cut for hay instead of harvesting for grain, alfalfa not being cut, uh, burn bans across the Dakotas. The, uh, South Dakota has initiated the state drought task force uh, within, the, within the recent period. Uh, the Fort, Pe uh, Fort Peck tribe has prepared a disaster declaration for drought conditions that are happening on the reservation there in Montana. Uh, into northern Minnesota, a lot of uh, things are, are we're dealing with heat stress from rapid loss of soil moisture. Um, there was a cool May there and in, in a little bit of a cool May in, in, in Minnesota, but uh, indications are there was really no fruit damage or anything from that, but mostly just the heat stress from the rapid uh, uh, soil moisture loss. Across the southern tier of counties, really it's a, it's a story about going from wet to hot and dry. And I put, you know, a question, do we have this drought looming? Obviously, it's developed in northern Missouri, so it's more than just looming at this point. But what is it like moving forward as far as conditions go? Uh, where corn was planted on time and it wasn't too wet, conditions are good. And the heat can even help, obviously, develop deeper roots. But anybody having to plant late, soybean late, they're really struggling with some of the heat stress. There is some rolling, which, which can be expected and isn't unusual. Uh, but we got reports from Pat out of Missouri of some turning yellow because of path, uh, potassium uptake issues. Again, the sidewall compaction issues, uh, soil crusting and, and soybeans breaking necks that, to try to emerge. Uh, some no water in, in some cases for germination for soybeans and pumpkins. And there will be a concern for additional stress on irrigation and, and nurseries if the dryness continues. Switching over to impacts on water and snow, so I got some great photos from Wendy Kelly out of Wyoming. Uh, this is a Cliff Creek flowing uh, into the Hoback River in western Wyoming, that rich chocolate milk kind of color, uh, ra you know, the rapid runoff from, from snow melt there. Uh, there is some flooding that's taking place, so this picture below it is from the New Fork River in Sublet County in western Wyoming on June 8th, uh, the river clearly out of its banks there. And then a snapshot of the western Lake Erie Basin as well. Uh, some heavy rain fell over Memorial, Memorial Day weekend in the Maumee River drainage. We have a nice photo showing the sediment plume uh, into that part of the lake. So uh, a slide on the Great Lake water levels. They're running quite high for this year compared to last year and the long-term average. And we can see that in the plot here on the right in all the five lakes here. Uh, lake Erie uh, in particular, the water levels are the highest since 1998. Uh, there's been some complaints about rising water levels along beaches and piers there, but not really too much in the way of damage. Uh, one, thing that, one of the things that we, we try to keep an eye on in terms of the western Lake Erie Basin is the harmful algal bloom projections. Uh, so because it's been a very wet May across the Maumee River Basin, the total bioavailable phosphorus is running high, higher than some of the mid mid um, um, mid-season expected loads, and so uh, the projection is to have kind of a mild uh, 
bloom severity in terms of the harmful algal blooms and that does have an impact on recreation and, and could possibly have an impact on water as well. So turning to the NRCS snow water equivalent uh, map, the Snowtel um, SWE here. So we'll start in the north uh, with Montana. Uh, greater than average, you know, above or close to 150%, above 130 here across the northwest uh, remaining. Across the southern part of the state, that, that's dropping very rapidly and, and we're getting down um, quite low here in, in a couple of the areas. If we turn to Wyoming, again, we have a lot of snow in the Wind River Mountains. Um, uh, there's indications of at least eight feet still remaining at some of the higher elevations above 10,000 feet, but snow is coming off the Teton Mountains pretty quickly. Uh, like the photos I showed, the rivers are full and raging and there is some flooding, but the indication is it's not as bad as years past. Um, and the livestock turnout dates onto some of the forest land is being delayed because of you know snow still coming off and the forage not available. Uh, farther south into Colorado, the cooler may sort of delay uh, the, the snow melt there, but it's still in full swing. Uh, conditions are, are, are good. The reservoirs and lakes are filling up, so there, there's not too much concern across this region. Uh, turning to the snow, uh, the snowpack SWE, so the amount uh, total above Fort Peck, um, about 14% of the peak still remains. We can see here from the blue curve rapidly coming to a close in terms of the the amount of sweet remaining uh, in these basins. Uh, the total four peck to garrison, about 19% of the peak, about four inches remaining here. So that is a little bit above average in, in, in that part, uh, but not much. Pretty, pretty close to the seasonal average and, and quickly coming to, to a close there. Uh, with the Platte River Basin, again, um, following along with the seasonal progression, about 16% of the peak sweet remaining for the North Platte and 9% remaining for the South Platte. So these are, are again, coming to a uh, close where we're getting uh, down um, close to zero here in the next couple of, of months. Some other issues that, that are coming up. So uh, may have seen the, the story about the North Dakota State Ag Commissioner's desire to open up these conservation reserve program lands. Uh, this obviously uh, is a problem when you're dealing with pheasants nesting and transition of these lands will be slow and not expected till probably late July or early August. But it, there's a lot of concern here about how to feed the, feed the cattle and obviously with a lot of the cattle sales going on, that's really indicative of the problem. Uh, we could ask the question about fire risk across the Northern Plains. Right now there's no large events, uh, but we are getting past the precipitation peak, so there could be an opportunity for uh, or there's an opportunity, the opportunity for improvement uh, would, would likely be diminishing on a general sense. Um, we'll see what the outlooks say here, but uh, certainly it's something to keep in mind as we move forward. Some other issues, we got nice pictures from Pat, Missouri, showing the turf turning brown. Uh, there was a local very extreme heavy rain event in southern Indiana back in May 19th, so a day after the last webinar. Uh, the river there, the Blue River, uh, Salem rose nine feet per hour just before the equipment maxed out, so that caused millions of dollars of damage on that on uh, in that locale. Uh, again, Wisconsin's so wet, there's concern getting the plants in the ground, uh, and and some impacts out of Michigan because of the the May 8th and 9th freeze. There is indication of some injury there, um, but it varies very widely. All right, so let's turn to the outlooks then. Uh, the question. Of, the El Nino Yo. So this is uh, an oldie but a goodie, I think, in terms of, of what, what we can expect. Um, just going to run through seven-day precipitation, some river flood, 8 to 14 day outlook, get into INSO predictions, and then try to go through this uh, as quickly but succinctly as possible. So the seven-day QPF forecast, again, we one of the areas we're looking at, northern Missouri, southern Iowa, northern Illinois here. So uh, if the QPF does pan out over the next seven days, this could help alleviate uh, the drying conditions that have been taking place here. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of precipitation from eastern Montana down into South Dakota. Uh, and so that could exacerbate some of the conditions that are happening up there. Uh, elsewhere across the region, we're looking at probably close to normal precip if the QPF uh, verifies. Uh, not surprisingly, with a lot of the areas seeing warmer and drier conditions, there's no real significant river flood um, 
expected through, through the next seven days or so. Um, I just wanted to put that in there to reflect those conditions. Uh, in terms of the 8 to 14 day temperature and precipitation probabilities, this runs for the 22nd of June through the 28th. Uh, generally, it reflects a weak ridging troughing pattern across the U.S. So uh, it favors kind of a faster flow, a zonal flow across across the U.S. from west to east. Uh, there, um, so temperatures are going to align with this north-south gradient. So we think across the northern tier, there's a greater probability of below normal temperatures. Uh, equal chances across southern Montana, Dakotas, and parts of the central part and into Ohio. And then greater than um, 33 or 40 um, percent of seeing above normal temperatures across the southern sections. Uh, with this weak ridge here, we'll see a lot of perhaps shortwave activity quickly moving by, so the, the chances of precipitation in the eastern sections is a little bit greater than, than, than it would otherwise be. Looking at the INSO conditions, uh, we, we've seen this kind of go from we think El Nino uh, is likely to occur to kind of equal chance with, with neutral conditions, and now uh, we're seeing that neutral conditions are favored over El Nino conditions, which is only about 35% in the upcoming fall and winter season. Uh, so right now the consensus is we're looking at neutral conditions uh, through the remainder of 2017 and into the winter of 2018. So that really doesn't, uh, in terms of the long-term forecast then, uh, there's really this lack of strong climate mode. So the Ju July temperature and precipitation probabilities, uh, widespread uh, greater than 33 or 40 percent probability of above normal temperatures except here in parts of Montana where it's equal chances. And, and this is just based really on the mo model ensemble um, and influence of decadal time scale. So without really the ENSO push or the, any of the strong climate modes, uh, we're looking at above the likelihood above average temperatures here. As far as precipitation, there is a, a little bit of an indication of, of a a greater probability of above normal precipitation across Montana and western North Dakota. It's relatively weak and, and doesn't really exceed 40 percent in many areas. Uh, conversely, across Colorado and Wyoming, there is a, an increased probability of below normal uh, precipitation with equal chances throughout the remainder of the north central region. If we go out to the three-month temperature, it's very similar to July, so we're looking at mostly uh, higher probabilities of above average uh, temperatures with equal chances there in Montana, but uh, decreasing or increasing chances of above normal precipitation across the northern sections, uh, the, the northern plains, Montana, and the Dakotas as well. So that could be uh, good news to help alleviate uh, some, of, some of the drought conditions that we're seeing uh, throughout the summer. Equal chances are likely of above, below, and near neutral or near average for the remainder part of the central U.S. And so that equates to, to the drought outlook here. We're looking at northern plains persistence in, in many of these regions um, um, throughout the season. So despite the, the above normal or the, the, greater than, the greater probability of above normal precip, we're still looking at uh, persistence here in, in a lot of the regions. Um, but some removal uh, likely in some of the regions of this. So it's kind of a mixed signal, a mixed idea here across the northern plains. In northern Missouri, uh, that's like drought removal likely according to this outlook, probably based on, on, on the QPF that's expected over the next week or two in the general pattern. So I'll briefly, the summary of conditions kind of split these again in the, in the rapid development of drought across the northern plains and, and northwest Minnesota, a lot of impacts. I encourage checking out the USDA Midwest Climate Hub for a lot more details on those. Uh, there has been some relief in the precipitation this week, but we'll see if that continues. We've had this rapid transition from cool, wet to hot, dry conditions across the central and eastern Corn Belt uh, with issues related to that as well. In terms of the outlook, um, I think the big, big story is El Nino not likely to occur through northern hemisphere winter, uh, so w warmer conditions are likely for the whole region this summer based on just long-term decadal trends and some uh, antecedent uh, soil moisture as well. Um, so with that, I think I want to go ahead and close since I'm going a bit over time here uh, and, and just uh, let, let everyone know that today and past recorded presentations are available at the, at the links provided. Again, we, a lot of collaboration with the National Climate, uh, Climatic Data Center, the CPC, the Drought uh, Portal, 
the National Drought Mitigation Center, state climatologist, and the regional climate centers. So thank you, and uh, thank you for bearing with me for this uh, uh, first trip down the drought webinar. Thanks. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, we have a, do have a couple of questions, um, but before we get to them, I, a couple of things I wanted to help point out is, and maybe you can um, um, talk a little bit more about them, or Dennis, since uh, we we can get on or off the phone as easily as possible. Uh, May and June are critical growing season precipitation periods across much of the uh, north central part of the U.S. Yes. I wanted to point that out in that if if we miss, um, if you will, miss uh, precipitation in some regions. You're talking about um, having to make that up in July and August, which is is really tough in most mm -hmm. years. Now, last year was diff was different than that. Uh, we actually uh, the rain actually turned on for a large area over the uh, of the Midwest during that period. So, uh, this isn't really a question; it's more of a more of a, uh, a comment that I wanted to make. Um, the other thing I want I'd like to say is, uh, and I think Adnan, if you're still on, um, um, North Dakota and South Dakota have initiated their, uh, okay. their their state their state drought groups um, and if anybody's interested in the chat section of the webinar is where I put the connect Adobe connect information for the re, uh, sub regional or regional whatever you want to call it the Dakotas and Montana sort of discussion next week um, of uh, uh, of drought in that region, so so you can look at that the chat section. Hopefully, you can grab that and uh, um, uh, and participate if you want to. And again, it's not going to be about any other. It's not really going to be about any other region other than the, the Dakotas and, and Montana. And we'll have uh, localized folks talk about that as well as a discussion of the drought monitor and how that gets put together. We have a lot of questions about that, especially during dry times on what goes into it, how can I participate, and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to say those things, and I guess that's it, other than a couple of the questions here. Let me see if uh, Adnan has anything he wants to add. Stand by, Adnan. I'm going to try to uh, hear me? meet you. There you go. Yeah, can you hear me? Right now. Yeah. yeah uh, you have anything you want to add? Yeah, we just said uh, a... <laughs> yep, North Dakota. We just had a state drought slash wildfire collaboration team meeting uh, with the state, and and I took some notes. Uh, basically, it is really uh, the drought perspective, and and plus the the burn bans. And and Aaron mentioned some of the counties. To be exact, uh, the the governor declared uh, the burn ban in the 30 counties, and and North Dakota has only 51 meaning that more than 50% uh, of the uh, the area in North Dakota is experiencing burn ban. And uh, timely rain versus a not timely rain uh, discussion Doug mentioned earlier. And some of the agronomists I talked in here is really hopeful, still hopeful that uh, timely uh, the rain can still uh, get us out of uh, further uh, damage in the eastern North Dakota, but the western North Dakota, it seems like things are too late because uh, uh, it is not only this small grain problem. We always thought the reason why the small grains are so short is the drought stress um, uh, led by the, uh, the lack of um, um, what, what am I thinking? The photosynthesis, uh, which is needed to uh, the, uh, enhance the, the growth rate, and also I noticed from the call from the Department of Ag that it is not only small grain problem, but also the row crops too. Uh, I've seen some pictures that the row crops are not uh, germinating, and and fields are indicating a lot of gaps and more gaps than the plants. So the uh, the further rain is not going to help, but um, and there was an agreement that the recent rains was needed and additional moist will be needed to carry the crops through flowering and grain fill. Um, so, and some of the other things we talked is the limited waters in the dugouts increase the particulates concentration ratio, creating the water quality problems for the, the cattle. And Aaron mentioned that how many kettles uh, are being sold in South Dakota and North Dakota. Um, and 
if I wanted to add one more thing that the uh, Ag Commissioner opened a um, hay hotline and based on what I know this that hotline is quite busy that's all I have to add thank you Adnan um, sorry my phone keeps cutting out I'm sort of doing this remotely from Boulder Colorado today and not in Kansas City where I normally am so <laughs> if I drop off I drop off and uh, we'll just Extend it then. Uh, a couple other questions. Um, how is the dryness uh, affecting crops? I think uh, you covered a lot of that, uh, uh, Aaron, in some because um, the question was asked very early in the uh, presentation. Uh, I wonder if uh, uh, Dennis, you had anything else you wanted to add to what uh, what Aaron had to say? Yeah. The, I mean, we, we can't compare to 2012 completely at this point for a couple reasons. Uh, it's, it's worse than 2012 further north in the Dakotas uh, because uh, conditions in the Dakota, Dakotas didn't develop until further into the season. Uh, we've had much more of the impact early in the season. What happens with crops uh, is still to be determined by the rest of the season at this point. If things moderate, uh, this hot, dry period in early June could actually be somewhat of a benefit to corn because it's pushed. And this is a time when it's, it's developing its root system, and if it has dry conditions, it will it will push its root system deeper, if trying to find moisture and nutrients. So we could end up being a positive. It really depends on what's going to happen after this. The other thing you have to remember is that corn is heavily impacted by what happens in July. It's tasseling period, and soybeans are more heavily impacted by what happens in August. So we still have a lot to be determined on the corn and soybean side. Thanks, Dennis. Say, um, I, I wanted to make something a little uh, more clear. We had a comment from Kent Thurer from North Dakota. Uh, just, just pointing out that the 30 county bans that uh, Adon mentioned are county initiated, and it's not a state ban or declaration at this time, um, according according to Kent. And uh, uh, another question was, or another, yeah, a question from Diane Mancleger was, uh, is there something influencing influencing the localized fast moving storms? And and I, I assume you meant. Uh, Earlier this week, there, a couple complexes actually moved through North Dakota or to the Dakotas, as well as other states. Um, anybody want to comment on that? The the question was how quickly storms are moving. Is that what she was asking about? I, I mean, I, I think it was in relationship to, to showing the 8 to 14 day outlook. So, you know, generally reading the guidance there, uh, we're switching to a pattern where we've got these this general weak ridging and troughing pattern across the United States. So it's really more of a, a, a zonal flow, a flow from west to east, which tends to be, you know, it tends to keep the storm systems moving along instead of moving slower when you've got an amplified flow across the country. So generally the guidance is, is on the eastern side of that ridge across the central U.S., there could be numerous shortwave, uh, you know, small systems that move around the eastern part of that ridge, and that's what's giving the greater than 33% probability of above normal precip from Minnesota down through Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, northern Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Did I explain that okay? Yeah, I think so. Hello. Okay. So, uh, um, this you questions? Dennis, are you there? Uh, you keep cutting out, Doug. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so Dennis, are you looking through the questions? I can't see them. Oh, you can't see them. Okay, well, um, storms are coming through to 40 to 70 miles an hour. Um, I think that's uh, that happens the plains, I guess. Um, there was a question from Jerry o Oster that said, as soils dry out,
I'm back for what it's worth. Um, let me see if I can get to these last questions before I hang up again. Sorry. As soils dry out, especially in uh, uh, South and North Dakota, are there chances for a flash drought? And Jerry, I'd say very quickly that this is indicative of a flash drought that we're having right now. It's not, in some cases it's pretty serious, in other places it hasn't become, you know, exceptional or anything. But it, this is the hot, hot, dry weather, a lot of wind. It doesn't take long for those top layers of soil to, to dry out and it have, have impacts, especially on agriculture. Yeah, I think that's reflected really strongly in the three class degradation in one month in the US drought monitor as well. Yep. Yeah, if you have any questions on that, uh, some of those tools, uh, some of the things that, uh, uh, that the uh, evaporative stress uh, um, in, in index and things like that are very uh, specific to look at flash drought and where it shows brown and, and, and various colors like that uh, is a good indicator that flash, flash drought is occurring. Uh, Doug, can you still hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Adam. Um, uh, I wanted to make a comment about the flash drought. Uh, in, in particularly in North Dakota, we had a, a switch uh, between the wet to dry starting in March. And the previous uh, six seasons uh, total was the ninth wettest. And the reason why we did not feel the drought uh, uh, as much as we could have if everything was normal because we utilized that leftover moisture in the soil that was left over from the previous uh, season. And, and when the March, April, and May became much drier than normal, uh, three months in a row, uh, the farmers still utilized that excessive moisture from the previous season and we did not really realize the impact of the drought as much as we would normally. And also the cooler, yeah. cooler temperatures played an important role. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the temperatures uh, increased and, and lost that moisture into the air, we started getting into that accelerated uh, impact. Uh, that's what we've been experiencing. And you're right, this is the flash drought. Yeah. There are some, uh, some indications that some of the warmth for part of the region uh, uh, earlier in the year, especially across uh, um, especially, uh, let's say, there, in, in some of the areas that that are being impacted by drought right now, were influenced by warmer than normal uh, winter conditions, which actually evaporates. It doesn't evapotranspirate, but it, it definitely um, has uh, allows evaporation and, and 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 use, if you will, of of some of that moisture. Um, that's all the questions I have at the moment. Uh, anybody have any final comments? All right. Uh, in that case, thank you very much, Aaron, uh, and everybody else on the call. I appreciate uh, uh, you all coming and um, asking questions, and Aaron for doing the presentation. We'll be back next month with uh, Jeff Andreessen. Uh, I forgot the date. <laughs> Anybody know off the top of their head? 20th. 20th of July. 20th of July. So thank you very much, and hope for rain. Have a good day. <laughs>